as well with you guys. Give them a round of applause. Give them a round of applause. That's an original, right? It's an original. What you just played, original. Original? No? Yeah? No? <laughs> we thank God for your lives. We appreciate you guys. You're doing so well. Amen. Welcome to Sunday service. Are we excited to be here today? Are we excited? Look at your neighbor and say, I'm excited to be here. Amen. So we're going to go into the Word, and I'm really excited to be here once again. I was here last week, and I was given a message on putting God first. Putting God first. How many people were here and blessed by the message? Putting God first. Look at your neighbor and say, have you put God first? Have you put God first this week? Yeah? Putting God first. So I mentioned last week that everyone has something, something or someone in their life that comes before everything else. And we define this as being your priority. This is the thing that directs your path. This is the things that influence your information, influences your decisions. And that's your priority. And we talked about how we can put God first in everything that we do. So again, I ask, is God your priority? Do you put God first? Because whatever is first in your life is obvious to God and it's obvious to everyone around you. We mentioned that it's impossible to put to fit God into a busy life. But if you empty out your life first, start with God, then everything else will naturally fall into place. Ask your neighbor, have you emptied your life out? Have you emptied your life out? Have you started with God? So today we are going to continue on the topic, put God first. And we're gonna go back to our anchor text, which is Matthew chapter 22, verse 35 to 38. The same passage that I used last week, And I hope that you guys have highlighted this passage or it's heavily underlined. I feel like this is a really important passage in the life of us Christians. Amen. Matthew chapter 22 from verse 35, I read. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Like I said, you should have this passage highlighted in your Bible. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So I'm going to start by emphasizing a very, very important truth today. You see, everything, everything that you could hope for in life, Everything that you could desire in life, everything that you're fighting for, that you're pushing for, that you're striving for in life, whatever it may be, whatever it is in your life that right now you think, I must get this. The truth I want to tell you is that all of these things have already been purchased for you at a price that you cannot afford to pay. Jesus Christ has already purchased this for you. And I'm not just talking about salvation. I'm talking about everything in life, all the promises that God had for you. He has already purchased it for you. Everything concerning your career, everything concerning your marriage, everything concerning your health, everything concerning your wholeness, whatever it is you're striving for, the good news and the absolute truth is that God has already purchased this for you at a price that you cannot afford to you at a price that you cannot afford. Yeah, that's the absolute truth. So I have two boys, and the truth is, I do not wait for them to tell me that they're hungry before I stock my fridge. Yeah? Every week I go to the supermarket, I know exactly what they like. I know when they're hungry at lunchtime, what they need. When they're hungry in the evening, what they need. So I go shopping, and I stock up my fridge. So when they say, mommy, I'm hungry, I tell them, go to the fridge. Yeah, one of them's old enough to do that. Go to the fridge and take this. Or lunchtime, you have this as a snack. So dinner time, you can have this as a snack. That's how God is to you. He knows what you need even before you get to that point of realizing that you need it. Yeah, that is God. So whatever it is you're fighting for right now, whatever it is you're striving for right now, if you put God first, Go to him first. I don't expect my son to think, I'm hungry. Okay, let me go out the front door 
go to the shops and start buying stuff because I'm hungry. No, he comes to me first and tells me he's hungry. And that's what God wants you to do. Go to him first. And I find that the reason a lot of us are not putting God first is because we believe we have to take it upon ourselves to fight for that which God has already given us. We feel like it's our, that we are our own responsibility. We don't act like children with a parent. And so we fight for things that God has already said, just come to me. I have it ready for you in a lovely package. Put God first. I'm going to go to John chapter 15, verse 5, which says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It says, if you remain in me, if you keep my commandments, if you make me first, if you make me your priority, then, then you, you will bear fruit. If you come to me first and you remain in me. But the important thing to know is that Jesus is the vine. You are the branch. Jesus is your source, yet you're the one that produces the fruit. You're the one that produces the fruit. So I have a question. What happens to the branch when it is disconnected? Anybody? When the branch is disconnected from the tree, from the vine, what happens to it at that instant moment? So if you walk past and the branch fell to the ground, does it die immediately? Does the fruit disappear immediately? No? So you see, some of us, we've disconnected from Christ, but we still have fruit. And we'd like to believe that everything is going well because we have fruit. You used to be on fire for God because you were connected to Christ at one point. But you've lost that connection. God is no longer first in your life, but you think everything's going well because you're still doing well in your job. You're still your boss's favorite. You still get the first pick in all the projects. Your marriage is still going well. Your health is still going well. You still have the fruit, but you're no longer connected to Christ. God blesses you, and that which he blesses you with becomes your priority. You start to put that first. Yeah, there was a time you were jobless. So God came first. He blessed you with a job, and then your job came first. Yeah? There was a time you were single, and God came first. He blessed you with the marriage, and then that marriage came first. Do you get where I'm going? There was a time you were lonely. God came first. You turned to God. He blessed you with friends, and then those friends came first. There was a time you were broken, and God came first. He blessed you with wholeness. He made you whole. And then your pride came first. You see, some of us have disconnected from God, but everything still looks good. The fruits are still there. So we think we're still okay. Yeah, but deep down, you know you've pushed God to the side. But things are still working for you. You're like, yeah, I'm still the top of my, of my game. I'm still at the top of my game. But you've disconnected from God. So after a while, what happens? And a while can mean many things. A while can mean a few days. A while can mean a few weeks. In fact, a while can mean a few years. After a while, what happens to a branch that's no longer connected to its source? It dies. It becomes bare. The fruits pass their time, but it doesn't bear new fruit. It begins to wither. There's some people you meet years down the line, and you look at them, and you're like, what happened? You were on fire for God. You were on top of your game. What happened? Because at some point, they disconnected from God and they started, they started to wither. They started to wither. They didn't, they didn't bear any more fruit. And the sad thing is people start to blame God. They say, God, you blessed me with this job. And I was successful at this job. Then all of a sudden, you're relegated. Things weren't working for you. And you say, God, but you blessed me with this job. So why is it going so wrong? Some of you, God blessed you with a relationship whilst you were connected to him. 
He blessed you with a relationship, but all of a sudden the relationship went wrong. You might have got as far as introduction, as far as engagement, even as far as marriage, as far as marriage, and things have gone wrong. And you're like, but God, why did you let me marry this person? Why did you let me marry this person if you knew it wasn't going to go right? I prayed to you before I married this person. You said, yes, go ahead. So why would you let me go ahead when you know that it wasn't going to work out? And the truth is because when God said, yes, you were connected to him, you then lost your focus and started to focus on something else. You became disconnected from God. And as long as you are disconnected from God, whatever fruit you had whilst you were connected to God cannot be sustained. It will eventually fail. It will eventually fail. You've seen the story of many artists. They start in church. They start in church and they're blessed in church. They now enter into the circular world. They disconnect from God. And it's going well for them. Even for many years, it goes well for them. Nobody talks about their time, their humble beginnings in the church anymore. I can think of several artists in my head. And then after a while, they start to wither. You look at them and you say, what a shame. How, did, how can somebody with such skill and such talent end up like this? They started with God. But at some point, their gift, their talent, what God blessed them with became their God. And that cannot, it cannot sustain you. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 22 says, The blessing of the Lord makes one rich. And he adds no sorrow to it. Whatever God blesses you with, it cannot bring sorrow if you remain in him. I'll give you an example. When I finished um, my GP training, I travel about 90 minutes a day to go to work. And I prayed to God. I said, God, give me a job that's nearby. I'm tired of traveling. And God blessed me with a job that was nearby. I was over the moon. I even came to church and I testified. And the job was brilliant. It was 12 minutes drive from my house. I was having a wonderful time. People treated me well. And about 10 months into that job, God said, it's time to move on. Another opportunity fell on my lap. It was unknown territory, but God told me it's time to move on. And so I, had to, I, I heeded the voice of the Lord and I moved on. You see, what God blesses you with initially is, this, is for that season in your life. But if I had sat on that blessing and said, you know what, no, this job is my life. You stop listening to God, you disconnect from God and you start to focus on the job. Only God knows what would have happened to me if I had remained in that job. Yeah? Obedience to God leads to fruitfulness. Disobedience will lead you to bondage. Obedience will always lead to fruitfulness. Disobedience will lead, will lead to bondage. Just because something looks good, it feels good. Or even if God said yes at that time, if you don't obey him and move on, that thing will lead you to bondage. It will lead you to bondage. But if you hear the voice of the Lord, hearken to the voice of the Lord, because that blessing is not your God. God is your God. And if you listen to him and hearken to him and move with him, i.e. remain in him, you will continue forever. You will continue to be fruitful. You don't know where God is taking you. All you see is now. You don't know the fruits that God has planned for you to bear. Just because you're bearing mangoes right now. God might decide in the future, I want you to bear bananas. And later on from then, I want you to bear pineapples. You understand? God has a plan for you. But you have to remain in him. I'll give you another example with my husband. He started a job um, when we first got married for G4S. Have we all heard of G4S? Yeah, big company. And he was there for a while. And then eventually he said, you know, my heart is, my, my spirit is unsettled. It's time to move on. And I was like, babes, G4S. And this is around the time of the Olympics when G4S was all over the news. I'm like, this is, this is a big company. You want to move on? I even wanted to move on to a company that I had to Google to even know what they were doing. And I was like, are you sure you want to leave G4S? As in, if I tell anybody my husband works for G4S, they're like, oh, okay. Now I want to move to Red Snapper. Who's heard of Red Snapper? Anybody here heard of, heard of Red Snapper? <laughs> he wants to move to Red Snapper. But his spirit was unsettled. And as a supporting wife that I am, I supported. 
So <laughs> he moved on to Red Snapper. And you know what? God blessed him. God promoted him in Red Snapper. He now got a, a job. He got a position. You know those positions where somebody say, what does your husband do? And you can't really give it a title. You have to explain. Do you get what I mean? Like if anybody asks my husband, what does your wife do? He'll say, doctor. Everybody understands. When people say, what does your husband do? I say, well, he's a specialist recruiter for people that have retired in the police force that want to do contract job. Even his title in his email is one long sentence. I can't remember. It's one long sentence. But at the end of it, or at the beginning, she has said manager. And then on top of that, he was blessed with a company car. Not just any company car. This was like, was it a 17 reg or, or an 18 reg? Um, Range Rover Evoque, and it was paying chicken change for it. Good job, good job. We were enjoying it. We had a second car at last, you know. I'd be like, yeah, I'm off to Tesco, please. Don't forget to pick up Toshi at his uh, birthday party, whatever. You understand, we were enjoying. We had a second car. After a while, he said, I'm unsettled. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> After five years, he says, Something's not right. I mean, what do you mean something's not right? You're, you're a manager. You have an evoke. <laughs> you're saying something's not right. I said, my spirit is telling me it's time to move on. I even forgot to tell you, when he moved on from G4S, after a few months, that, that department collapsed. It collapsed. So the same thing he said, oh, you know, it's, it's not right. I just feel my spirit is telling me I need to move on. So he now got a new job. Or some, they headhunted him. And I remember asking when they were headhunting him, does this position come with a car? And it didn't, unfortunately. And I was like, ah, are you sure you want to leave this job? Because <laughs> there are many benefits to a second car, you know? But his spirit was unsettled. So as a supporting wife, I supported him once again. And he moved on to another job. Um, and God has really blessed him in that job. You know, God has brought him before great people. He doesn't have a car, but he's blessed. You understand? And I remember yesterday we went for a wedding of a colleague that used to work in the previous, in the previous office. And they were all like, oh, man, Olu, man, that place is it's on its way down. As in, since you left, it's just, it's, it's not, it's crazy. In fact, everyone in that department, they're all looking for new jobs. They're like, it's not working. But if he had focused on, with G4S, he had focused on the title, I work for G4S. And he didn't move on. Where would he be now? With the second job, he had, if he had focused on the car, which I focused on, I put my hands up. I was like, Lord Jesus, this is a good car. It's a second car. We need a second car. And I was sad. I remember the day he had to return the car. I was driving up. I was looking out the window. I was like, bye-bye, Evogue. <laughs> one day, one day. And I was sad, but, you know, he, he was like, no, it's time to move on. But if he had focused on that and said, you know, I'm the manager of blah, 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 blah. I've got a company car. If he had focused on it and decided to stay in that position when God was telling him to move on, where would he be now? Don't make your fruits your God. It's just a fruit. It's not your God. What God has blessed you with, don't let it replace God in your life. Anything in your life, that you empower as your God is given an unrealistic expectation to perform the duty of God in your life. I'll say that again. Anything in your life that you have empowered to be your God, you give that thing an unrealistic expectation to perform the duty of God in your life. If you decide to put your career first before God, you make it your God. So what happens when you're sick? Is your career going to save you? What happens when your marriage is breaking down? Is it your career that you're going to turn to? What happens when you're lonely and depressed? Is it that career that's going to help you? I remember one time when I was in training, and I was heavily pregnant, I was in training, I still had to be doing shifts, night shifts, on call shifts, etc. My husband said to me, look, you need to speak to them and tell them that you cannot continue this. And I was like, oh, I don't want to disappoint them. I don't want to do this. I said, look, let me tell you the honest truth. If for any reason anything happens to you whilst you're doing this shift and you lose this baby, the least, the, the most they'll do is send you flowers. 
they will replace you the next day. They will replace you the next day. Your career cannot heal you. Your husband cannot make you whole. It can't. So when I was younger, I grew up with Mills and Boom. Do you know Mills and Boom? I loved Mills and Boom. I read it endlessly. I had a bin bag in my room, and I used to read all the love stories. And when I finished those books, I would carry the bin bag to the market, and you'd get another bin bag of new books. So I used to have this unrealistic expectation that when I get married, I will live happily ever after. Unrealistic expectation. Marriage is good, don't get me wrong, but your husband cannot make you whole. Your wife cannot make you whole. Your friends cannot fill that void in your life. Your image might have got you this far. It got you that modeling contract. It got you that position in your office. But your image cannot give you permanent victory. Guess what? After a while, the wrinkles will start to show. No matter how good looking you are, somebody that's better looking with better eyelashes will show up the next day. Trust me, there's nothing you can do about it. So don't rely on your image. Don't don't rely on your physical appearance. Your ministry. Some of us, our ministry has become our God. You sing in the choir, you play the instruments, and your ministry becomes your God. But guess what? That's not going to get you to heaven. It's only God Only God can perform the duty of God in your life. Anything else that you make God in your life is a counterfeit. A counterfeit, I love that word. A counterfeit is a fraudulent imitation of something else. A counterfeit is a fraudulent imitation of something else with the intention to deceive or defraud. So there's certain things in your life that you've put first, therefore has taken a position of God in your life but it's a counterfeit. It's deceiving you. You think everything is working. As long as I focus on this job, as long as I focus on this project, as long as I focus on this, everything will be fine. But it will work well for now. But if you don't remain in Christ, you don't make him your priority, eventually everything will start to show. The fool says in his heart, this is Psalms chapter 14 verse 1, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. All of these things that you're putting first, they want to deceive you into believing that you don't need God. Some of us, we used to be on fire for God. We were first. God was first in our lives. We were on fire for him. We were in church, every Bible study. We wake up, we pray every morning. We bore fruit. And then we started focusing on other things. And those things became our God. And then you start to think, oh, I, I don't actually need God. If I just focus on this... If I focus on this and I can make it, and you start to think you don't need God. A fool says in a heart, says in his heart, there is no God. Anything that makes you say there's no God, I'm telling you now, anything that makes you push God aside, anything that when you wake up in the morning, you have a choice between your phone and your Bible. Anything that makes you say, pick your phone first. That thing that you're allowed to creep into your life to take the place of God in your life. That thing is is there to rob you of your inheritance because it's only with God that you can get that inheritance. Amen? God commands you to put him first so that he can perform the duty of God in your life. It's for your benefit. You see, when God says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, This is your first commandment. If you don't know God, you might think God has been arrogant. What does it mean I should love him? Why is he commanding me to love? You can't command people to love you. You need to be, it's a a world of, where we live in a free will world. You can't command people to love you. They have to choose to love you. Love is a choice. Why is God saying that I have to love him? You might think God has been arrogant. You might even think that God is insecure. That God needs you know, he's lonely. He needs you. He needs you to worship him. He needs to increase his number of followers on, on Instagram so he can beat the devil who has more followers. God does not need you. He's God. He doesn't need you. Guess what? If you don't worship him this morning, what will he call to raise, what will he raise up to worship him? So that's how powerful he is. If you choose not to worship him this morning, he will raise stones to worship him. 
So he doesn't need you. You need God. Putting God first is for your benefit. Because God desires to play the role of God in your life. But he cannot play that role if you don't make him God in your life. He's not disadvantaged or lacking if you don't make him first. So put God first. Put God first. He wants to fulfill his promises in your life. He does. The Bible says, my thoughts towards you are thoughts of good and not of evil. To bring you a hope and an expected end. He knows where he's taking you and he wants to fulfill that promise. But he's waiting because in the morning, the first thing you do is pick up your phone. You go on IG, you're liking this, liking this, liking this, liking this. And it's like, if only my daughter, if only my son will come first to me, then the blessings are endless. He will give it to you. He's not a stingy God. He's not a stingy God. He's waiting to bless you. If only you will put him first. Tell your neighbor, put God first. Put him first. You need to look at the world differently. You need to start acting like a child again. Some of us, we like to think we're bigger than we are. You're not. The word says that, the Bible says, God says that my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. When, um, so my son, when he's going into primary school, before, before he was going into primary school, in fact, as soon as he was born, I was already looking at schools. I knew the schools that I wanted him to go to. And I was monitoring those schools. I read the Ofsted reports. I went online. I read the reviews of mothers. I read the reviews from different articles. Which school do I think I want my son to go to? And then I made a decision that this is going to be the best school for him based on his current needs and based on the kind of man that I want him to become. So I chose a school for him. Based on that, he did not even know that he needed to choose a school until about July time when they did the last day of, of preschool. He now came to me and said, Mom, which school am I going to? But I've already done all the work. So I just had to tell him this is the school you're going to. Now, can you imagine if at that point when he identified that need, he decides to start doing his research? He decides to start visiting schools to make that decision. He's not going to read Ofsted reports like I do. He's not going to read reviews like I do. He's not going to read newspaper articles like I do. He's going to go to the school and look at the size of the playground and say, yeah, this playground is big. I like this school. He's going to go to the classroom and look at all the pictures and all the colors and all the games that they have. And he's going to base his decisions on that. Whereas I based my decisions on higher thinking, a higher level of thinking. So sometimes you're making decisions for yourself based on your earthly thinking, but God is thinking beyond that. You might think this girl is perfect for you. She's perfect. You're thinking this guy is perfect for you. He's the man of your dreams. He's going to make everything right. On what, on what basis? On your thinking. But God, as he knows your needs, even before you knew it, for time, he's been orchestrating the person you're going to marry. Based on your needs and based on the person he knows that he wants you to become, the person that he has destined for you to become. And so when he comes to you and says, this is the man you should marry, you'd be like, nah, 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 not this one. I can say that because that's what I did with my husband. I, said, I looked at him, I said, no. But I was basing it on my own thoughts. God's ways and his thoughts are higher than that. But if you put God first, my son came to me and said, which school am I going to? I said, this is the school you're going to. When he asked why, I couldn't explain it based on my own reasoning. I had to explain it based on his 
level of understanding. I said, you know what, the school is really good. It's very close to the house. It's only about 10 minutes walk. They said they have loads of nice games. They have nice colors in their classroom. You're going to really enjoy it. The teacher is really nice. The playground is really nice. You know, I had to explain it based on his level of thinking. I couldn't explain to him that I've read the Ofsted report. I've been online on the Daily Mirror to look at the league table. And the school is doing, if I said that to him, it means nonsense to him. And that's how you need, to, you need to become, you need to become like children and just trust God. He didn't argue with me. He's not going to argue with me, is he? But, you know, you, that's how you need to become with God. Trust that when you identify your need, that's not when God knows about your need. God knows about the need of tomorrow today. You don't. You don't know what you're going to need tomorrow. God does. And he's already done the background work. So when you identify the, that need, don't panic. Just go back to God. And say, God, what do you have me do? What do you want me to do? When Jesus went to the wedding, he already knew that they were going to run out of wine. It wasn't a surprise to him. He was not shocked. He knew they were going to run out of wine. But when his mother went to Jesus, he told the people, whatever he tells you to do, just do it. Don't start coming up with your own solution. Just do whatever he tells you to do. If he says do nothing, then do nothing because he's worked out that that's the best thing to do nothing. Put God first. Put God first. Don't do it yourself. You can't. It might work for now, but it won't last. Put God first. And so as we round up, I want to round up with Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 to 33, which is the same text I rounded up with last week. It says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Tell your neighbor, seek God first. Tell yourself, seek God first. Just pause for a minute once in a while and say, God, what do you want me to do? Because there's nothing in your life that surprises God. I had to come to that revelation one day. There is nothing that can happen in your life that God is saying, oh my goodness, what just happened? He already knows that what's going to happen is going to happen. So just go back to him and seek him first. Amen? Amen? And so as we round up, I just want to say a prayer. And if there's anybody here that want to put God first. They want to make a personal decision to come to God and make him their Lord and Savior. Whether there's anybody here that know that they were once connected to God and somehow they've disconnected, even though everything looks to be working right, but they know, they know in their heart that they've disconnected. I just want to pray for you wherever you are. We're going to pray as a family. So wherever you are, just put your hand on your heart and say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. From this point on, Lord Jesus, I want to make you first. Help me, Jesus, to make you first. Guide my life. And help me to do your will. In Jesus' name I've prayed. Now as I call the choir up to just help me with this song. We're still going to pray. We're going to pray for ourselves. That God should help us. But I just want us to, to just spend a minute to just study our lives. 
I might put in God first. Do you know, every day somebody dies. And once you cross that path, once you cross that road, you can't go back. And you stand before God. Will God say, yes, this is my daughter? Or will God say, do you know what, you, you left me on the back seat. I was always on your bedside table, but you never picked me up because you're so busy focusing on something else. Just look into your heart and just say, Lord, help me. I have to put you first. I have no other choice. If I'm going to make it, Lord, you have to come first. Amen.